Okay, our next speaker is uh, Joe Bassin, and he will be talking about the stochastic approach to non-equilibrium quantum spin systems. Thanks very much for the uh, invitation to talk at this very nice conference. Um, so this is some work I've been doing over the last few years trying to develop a stochastic approach for dealing with uh, non-equilibrium quantum spin systems. Uh, I should say at the outset, uh, pretty much the entirety of what I will say has to do with unitary evolution and emission uh, Hamiltonians. Uh, however, one of the things we're actually working on is to try and extend this to open uh, systems, uh, because once you have a mapping between uh, quantum dynamics and classical stochastic processes, Processes, there's actually many directions uh, to consider. Uh, it's also worth pointing out there is a sense in which uh, uh, non-hermeticity actually does creep into this uh, discussion. And actually, in relation to the previous talk, we just had some comments about diffusion on SU2 and uh, diffusion on SL2. Uh, and in fact, both of those features will appear uh, in this approach. So this work has been done uh, in collaboration with my graduate student uh, Stefano uh, De Nicola uh, and also my colleague Benjamin Doyon in King's uh, and it's just uh, appeared on the archive in the last couple of weeks. Okay? And I should say if there's any questions just please interrupt me as, as I go along. Okay? So I'll give a, an outline of the approach, I'll kind of tell you a little bit about this uh, stochastic approach and I'll start with a very simple uh, example uh, which is in fact where I learned about this method from more than a decade ago which is a problem that was cooked up by John Chalker uh, in relation to frustrated magnets uh, where he was applying this to the thermodynamics of a single cluster of quantum mechanical spins. Okay. So having then set up the problem for dealing with thermodynamics, I'll tell you about how to uh, extend this uh, for non-equilibrium dynamics. And there's been some recent very nice work by uh, Vladimir Gritzfeld looking at this for uh, Heisenberg models, okay? So a lot of the problems that kind of people have been interested in over the last few years in many body systems are trying to understand non-equilibrium dynamics of quantum spin systems. A lot of the progress comes from looking at one-dimensional integrable problems. If the problem's not integrable, actually you've got a hard time uh, trying to understand the dynamics of such problems. And so what I'm going to try and emphasize here is that this is a rather unique uh, method in the kind of uh, canon of kind of techniques that we have in so far as the fact that actually on line one it doesn't care about integrability or dimensionality and I'm going to try and illustrate uh, some of the initial results that we've got in this direction and what I think are kind of directions uh, for further research. So I'm going to concentrate on the kind of class of problems uh, known as dynamical phase transitions. So trying to look at analogs of phase transitions as a function of time rather than as a function of temperature. Uh, and I'll try and show you how this uh, stochastic approach actually uh, uh, both is able to reproduce uh, results from quantum dynamics, but also gives you some intuition uh, about how to understand uh, these transitions. So given that this is a short talk, I won't talk too much about other observables and these other uh, extensions, but if you have questions at the end, I can always uh, refer to this. Okay. So let me give you this kind of simple uh, pedagogical example that was considered by uh, John Chalker and his student uh, Patrick Hogan quite a while ago now. So John is kind of world expert in looking at frustrated magnetism. So you're interested in systems like pyrochlor lattices where you have spins on the vertices of some non-trivial uh, unit like this tetrahedron. And the idea is that if you have spins uh, pointing in different directions on a tetrahedron and interacting antiferromagnetically, it's not possible to actually satisfy all the antiferromagnetic interactions between these spins. And so they are frustrated, okay? So frustrated magnets are interesting because as you cool them down, down, this frustration inhibits conventional uh, magnetic order and you can get lots of interesting uh, ground state properties. So here he considered then a very simple toy example which is just the building block of such a frustrated antiferromagnet. Let's consider a bunch of spins on uh, the vertices of this tetrahedron, but it could be Q spins on some generalized uh, uh, object. And the idea is that if you look at these spins on this tetrahedron, every spin is interacting with every other spin. Okay, so this is known as the fully frustrated spin cluster. Okay, so because of that, you can write the Hamiltonian in a very nice form. You can write it as the sum of all the spins on this tetrahedron squared. And if you expand that out, you'll generate all the interactions between the spins plus diagonal terms, uh, which are just constants. Okay. Now, John made a very interesting observation that if you're interested in computing the partition function for this, okay, so it's a separate question as to why you're interested in, say, thermodynamics of a small system, but at least formally you can imagine computing the partition function of this little cluster, then 
one way in which you can actually look at this partition function is that it's some trace of e to the minus beta h, but it's involving this large spin that's interacting with itself, okay? Some capital S uh, all squared. So one trick that you sometimes see in the literature in a lot of kind of field theory approaches if you have an interacting problem is you decouple the interactions using a so-called hubbard stratonovich transformation. So you introduce this field h, whose job is essentially to act as a Gaussian variable so that if you do this integral over H, you generate the interaction you started with. Okay, So it says you have an interacting problem. In this case, it's a very simple interacting problem. But you have an interacting problem, and you can get rid of the interactions at the expense of introducing some auxiliary hubbard stratonovich field. You do the Gaussian integral. This is H squared plus H dot S. You do the integral over H, you get S dot S effectively. Okay, So you get back to where you started with. But having done this decoupling, okay, you immediately see quite a number of features, okay? The first is that this describes a single quantum mechanical spin, okay? Now it's a large spin, it's the sum of all the spins on this tetrahedron, but it's interacting with this field H, which has the interpretation of a stochastic magnetic field, it's Gaussian distributed. The other thing it buys you is that, you know, you want to compute the trace of this object and actually by decoupling these interactions, you make it possible to take the trace of this spin. And so you actually solve two problems at once. You've got rid of the interactions, you can do the trace and you have a nice representation that it describes a spin interacting with a stochastic magnetic field. So if you're interested uh, in this thermodynamics, okay, what's buried in this partition function is uh, actually a time-ordered exponential. It's ex implicit when you set up the path integral that in order to deal with the non-commutativity of these spin operators that you have some time-ordering operation. And so you have this evolution operator for a spin in a stochastic magnetic field. And so if you now do the trace, you can do the trace over this object, all the spins are decoupled, so it's raised to the power Q, but then it's averaged over this uh, Gaussian weight. Okay? So this is what you find. So this partition is this integral of this trace raised to the power Q, and this average uh, I introduce as meaning average over these uh, Gaussian weights. So you have a simple expression for this partition function. Okay. Now, at the moment, we've not done anything. We've just kind of recast the problem uh, in this way. Uh, but John made a, another interesting observation that actually this time evolution operator, because uh, if I go back, it's some kind of complicated time-ordered exponential, but it's a linear combination of elements in the algebra, which means you can re-express it as an element of the group. And so you can actually... Uh, think about this complicated time evolution operator instantaneously in your favorite parameterization of SU2. Okay, so he says introduce some new, let's say, Euler angles, uh, uh, alpha, beta, gamma, and the idea is this tells you where your evolution operator is uh, in this uh, group theoretic formulation. So in this approach, what this decoupling is telling you is that these alphas and betas and gammas, they change as a function of time because your spin is interacting with these stochastic fields, these Gaussian noises. And so you can actually set up a set of Langevin type equations for the evolution of these coordinates alpha, beta, gamma in terms of the components of these stochastic fields, okay? So if you remember when you kind of meet kind of Langevin equations, you're normally thinking about some kind of particle subject, let's say, to so some damping and some noise, just turn the damping off. This is a very similar set of equations. It's a little bit more complicated because you're kind of moving on this SU2 group manifold, but conceptually, there's no uh, real difference. Now, John didn't actually uh, solve these equations in this way, okay? Let me just tell you just at the outset what it says is, if you want to understand this quantum partition function, you could, in principle, solve this set of stochastic differential equations and reconstruct quantum uh, thermodynamics. In this simple case, actually, it's advantageous to say, well, look, I mean, instead of looking at uh, Langevin equations, which describe individual stochastic trajectories, you can equally switch uh, to a Fokker-Planck uh, approach where you change from this kind of stochastic approach to a deterministic Fokker-Planck equation for the probability distribution to be at a particular point on this SU2 group manifold. Okay, so if you just call this Q, that meaning uh, this coordinate alpha, beta, gamma, just some point on this uh, uh, sphere, then the idea is that your partition function could equally be written in terms of the endpoints at given time uh, on this sphere with some probability uh, to being at these different values of Q, 
what is the equation governing this probability distribution? Well, that is just uh, the problem of diffusion on this particular group manifold. So if you were in real time, it'd be the Schrodinger equation here. We're in imaginary time. So this uh, Laplacian operator is just the Laplace Beltrami operator on SU2. Okay? So a lot is known about that problem. If you look at the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, these can be constructed explicitly. And so you substitute this into this expression for the partition function. And what do you find? Your partition function is a sum over e to the minus beta times some energy levels times some degeneracies, which you can compute exactly from this approach. Okay. Now, obviously, if you were trying to compute the partition function of a single cluster of spins, this is probably not the way you would uh, go about it. You'd actually use elementary properties of the spin operators. But what this example shows you is that there's actually a very natural way to compute exact expressions uh, for quantum problems, starting from a purely uh, classical approach. Okay? And what we want to do is we want to try and extend this now to uh, uh, large systems, kind of not just single clusters of spins, uh, but proper lattice models, uh, and also look at not just thermodynamics, but also uh, dynamics. Okay? So let me uh, take you through this. Okay? So this is some very nice uh, recent work done by uh, Vladimir Gritsev and one of his uh, students, where uh, he looked at uh, the canonical type of problem that we very often study in condensed matter physics, a Heisenberg model. Okay, So this is a generic Heisenberg model with some exchange interactions between spins on different lattice sites uh, with some, uh, let's say, applied magnetic field H. Okay, So I'm going to switch notations now. Before I was calling these hubbard stratonovich fields H, now I'm going to call uh, the hubbard stratonovich fields phi on the next uh, slide. Uh, I'm going to call the externally applied magnetic field H because this is rather standard in the literature. Okay. So what's the problem with dealing with such problems? Well, you know, if this is a simple nearest neighbor Heisenberg spin a half problem, uh, this is an integrable model, so you can actually make a lot of progress for equilibrium properties if it's in 1D and also dynamics, okay? But actually, if this is, uh, let's say, even an Ising model in a, both a longitudinal and a transverse field, so magnetic fields in different directions, this is not an exactly solvable problem. And so actually, you're kind of stuck on line one if you want to try and uh, start understanding the dynamics of this problem. So part of the problem of dealing with such problems is obviously that the spin operators are non-trivial. They have non-trivial uh, commutation relations. And so when you study such problems in the path integral representation, that's what the time ordering operation is keeping track of, is telling you that you're dealing with a non-trivial quantum problem. Okay? If you think about what we did in the last example, what we did is we traded that time ordering operation for these other variables, these alpha, beta, gammas, at the expense of introducing a, a set of stochastic differential equations. Okay? However, those stochastic differential equations are exact equations, and there's no approximations in writing them down. Okay? None at all. Okay? Yeah. No. So the, the simplest set of initial conditions that we'll talk about uh, we're going to start from some very simple initial states. We'll look at some kind of quench problems, where, for example, if you're looking at an Ising ferromagnet, you start with all of the spins down. In that case, your evolution operator, by definition, is unity at time t equals zero, which means that your fields psi, or as they will be called, so the alpha, beta, gammas in that previous example, would be all set to zero. Okay? If you wanted to consider different initial states, one way you can do this is you apply uh, an evolution operator to a given configuration, turn it into a given state you want, and so actually from that perspective, your SDEs would actually be started with different initial conditions. Okay? I should say that there is one complication, actually, in terms of initial conditions. Most of the initial conditions I'm talking about are simple initial conditions, like product states or maybe uh, classical NAEL states. If you want to start from the actual ground state of something like the quantum antiferromagnet, obviously you'd have to do a lot more work because that is a non-trivial beast in and of its own right. Okay? So most of what I'll talk about are for relatively simple initial conditions. Okay. So the idea then is that all of the dynamics of this model are contained in this uh, unitary evolution operator, uh, and it's non-trivial because of time ordering and also the fact that these operators don't commute. Okay? However, what we've seen is there's a couple of tricks we can use for dealing with this problem. 
The first is that we can decouple the interactions in this Hamiltonian using these hubbard stratonovich fields, okay? So it's something that goes as phi squared, okay? So this is phi squared. We've got a linear term phi dot s, and the integral over phi gives you your s dot s terms. That's your generic Heisenberg problem. And we have some applied magnetic fields, which you see just basically appear in the same way as these stochastic variables, okay? So later on, we'll define some capital phi's, which just mean it's a combination of our applied field, whatever they are, and also uh, these stochastic fields that we've introduced by the hubbard stratonovich transformation, okay? The second thing we need to do is we need to uh, use the fact that this is a time-ordered exponential, okay? So we need to do some uh, disentangling, as it's called, okay? So this was the term used uh, in Vladimir Gritsev's paper, and I think it's actually a very nice way uh, of thinking about this problem. It says that your time-ordered exponential is some linear combination of these capital phi's, which is these stochastic fields and the applied fields, the average is taken with respect to this Gaussian noise, as we did in the thermodynamics of this single cluster. But this time-ordered exponential uh, is now re-expressed as an element of the group. But this is not just one big spin, okay? This is a whole bunch of different spins because we're actually dealing with a fully-fledged Heisenberg model. So there's lots of different lattice sides, okay? But one advantage, a very important advantage, is because we did the hubbard stratonovich decoupling, all of these spins are just single spins at given lattice sites, okay? The interactions have gone into uh, the noise action, if you want to call it that. Let's just go back, okay? So we decoupled uh, these uh, spin interactions via these hubbard stratonovich fields, and so the interactions are actually embedded in this uh, noise action, okay? The other comment as well is that actually in doing this hubbard stratonovich transformation, I've been very cavalier in keeping track of uh, factors of i, in the sense that this is actually not an element of SU2. It's actually an element of SL2 because these coefficients psi are actually generically complex. So in the previous example, we were actually looking at a, a, a proper diffusion problem on SU2. Here, when we're looking at this real-time dynamics problem, actually this is... Uh, some non-trivial object residing in SL2 and actually is in general non-hermitian, okay? However, what we're going to do is we're going to average this uh, problem, or non-unitary, I should say, it corresponds to non-hermitian Hamiltonian. Uh, we're going to average this expression over different realizations of the stochastic process, and the claim is that if you do this, this gives you exact results for uh, unitary dynamics in a non-trivial quantum many-body system, okay? So these fields psi okay, which play the role of the alpha, beta, gamma, as we introduced before, uh, I'm going to refer to as disentangling variables. They say that, look, you've gone and done this hubbard stratonovich field transformation. All of your spins are now independent. They're interacting with the stochastic magnetic field. But to describe the time-ordered exponential, it's better to think in terms of some new coordinates uh, that parameterize this group manifold, okay? So these size satisfy uh, stochastic differential equations, okay? a little bit like what we saw when we looked at uh, the thermodynamics of a single cluster of spins. So now there's kind of, you know, these psi plus, psi z, psi minus, uh, first derivatives on the left-hand side. There's some noise terms, okay, involving these uh, stochastic hubbard stratonovich fields and our applied fields. And there's also some uh, nonlinear terms involving these variables, okay? So this is an exact set of stochastic differential equations that govern quantum dynamics, okay, for both integrable and non-integrable problems and in arbitrary dimensionality, okay? So the main question is whether or not it's actually possible uh, to solve these stochastic differential equations and actually try and make contact uh, with results uh, for quantum dynamics, okay? And the answer is yes, okay? As you would expect, there's no free lunch. I'm not going to dwell on this too much in this uh, short talk, but if there's any questions about that, I can maybe return to it at the end, okay? Um, However, just to come back to Manus's question, so these SDEs are going to be solved with the initial conditions where all these size are set to zero because my initial uh, evolution operator is just unity, okay?
So you can put these uh, SDEs in a kind of canonical form. So if you look up kind of literature on SDEs, uh, you've got some kind of uh, derivative terms of these variables. There's what you call kind of drift and diffusion coefficients, meaning some coefficients that are purely deterministic, something that involves uh, the noise. And what we want to do is to try and solve these SDEs, average over different realizations of the SDEs, uh, and then compute uh, quantum observables. Okay. Okay. So the question is, what are we going to study, right? Because there's obviously lots of dynamical problems you could look at. One problem that's actually rather natural to look at in this formalism is the so-called Loschmidt amplitude, okay? And there's a, a variety of reasons why uh, this is useful to look at. So this Loschmidt amplitude, you can define as the amplitude to return to an initial state after a given time, okay? So you prepare your quantum system in some initial state, psi time zero, you evolve as a function of time, and you just ask what's the amplitude uh, to wind up back in that same uh, quantum state, okay? So the reason why this is useful to look at in the stochastic formalism is that, first of all, it puts the evolution operator center stage, okay? It's basically about the simplest thing that we could possibly look at. It's an expectation value, essentially, of the evolution operator. If you look at other observables, like, say, the magnetization, so we also have results for that, which I'm not going to show, but again, I've got some slides on it. Um, you can think about time evolution of local operators, but there they'll involve more uh, 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 time evolution operators, so you have to do more hubbard stratonovich decouplings, which you can also do, okay? But it just makes things a little bit more involved. But conceptually, once you understand problems involving one evolution operator, you can sprinkle operators and other evolution operators around uh, depending on what observable you want to compute, okay? So this amplitude, okay, normally in the literature people don't look at the amplitude directly. First of all, it's a complex number, so you probably look at mod squared, and actually it's convenient to look at minus uh, n inverse times the log of mod squared, okay, n being the number of sites in my uh, system, and the reason is that, you know, this, uh, there's a very close analogy between this lambda parameter, which is a so-called rate function, and what you might write down in equilibrium if you're looking at thermodynamics, okay? So if you imagine for thermodynamics, uh, the partition function is trace of e to the minus beta h, okay? Here you've got something a little bit like that. Your evolution operator is e to the minus iht. You're not performing a trace, but you're sandwiching it between two states. So this is a little bit like a dynamical analog of this partition function. This rate function, lambda, uh, is a little bit like a free energy in that it's minus an inverse log of this uh, 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 mod a squared, okay? So the point is that this amplitude has some interesting features that if you look at this corresponding rate function, you can see non-analyticities uh, as a function of time in this rate function, which correspond to, if you like, analogs of thermodynamic phase transitions, but now uh, in the time domain. Okay, so there's been a lot of work uh, over the last few years looking at so-called dynamical quantum phase transitions, trying to look at non-trivial signatures in this rate function, uh, which maybe hark back to kind of thermodynamic phase transition. Yeah. Yeah, well, here, I mean, here, uh, there's a kind of very clear kind of large deviation form, right? So another way to say it is there's kind of an exponentially suppressed probability to wind up back in your original state right. as your system gets larger and larger. And what controls this is the rate function lambda, okay? So if you do large deviation theory and you're looking at kind of tails of some probability distribution. But if you happened by pure miracle yeah. to choose psi naught as the exact ground state, then you'd have no time uh, evolution. Uh, that's true, that's true. Yeah. So, no, no, but it's, a, but it's a good point. I mean, normally what we're doing is in these kind of quench problems. I, I didn't discuss that. You normally have in mind the fact that you start from a Hamiltonian. You start in the ground state of that Hamiltonian, but you abruptly change a coupling. Okay, so then your initial state is no longer uh, even an eigenstate of the post-quench Hamiltonian. It's called quench. You're uh, doing the quench. Quenches. Yeah. However, the other way to say it is that you can just say, well, I've got an initial state. It, the initial state is just a state. Okay, I don't care who gives it to me. I just start in a particular state. It doesn't have to be the ground state of a particular Hamiltonian. And I'm just unitarily uh, evolving under a prescribed Hamiltonian with one prescribed coupling constant. Okay. Okay, good. 
Okay. Uh, and actually, since I mentioned large deviation theory, I mean, let me just kind of refer back to that. I mean, one of the uh, conclusions of our work is actually uh, there's a very natural link between this kind of property in the classical dynamics, and actually I think there's a kind of much more sophisticated analysis that we should be able to do uh, in the thermodynamic limit uh, because of this large factor of n that just sits out of the front here. Okay? You're essentially saying that things where lambda has these peaks correspond to turning points uh, of A of t, which in a sense uh, can be perhaps dominated by some saddle points of this exponential in the thermodynamic limit, okay? but I'm, I'm not going to talk about that here. Okay, so let me just kind of illustrate this. So this is what we mean by this kind of dynamical quantum phase transition. He says you look at this Loschmidt amplitude, you construct the corresponding rate function, and there's the potential for having non-analyticities as a function of time, which play the role of thermodynamic phase transitions, but now it's in, in the time domain. Okay? And so what we want to see is, is it possible to see such things in this stochastic formalism? Okay. Actually, it's a rather non-trivial test because these are rather sharp features in the dynamics, okay? So it's not actually a priori obvious that you'd be able to resolve such features, um, but actually uh, it turns out you can, okay? And again, I'm not going to talk about this, but there's actually some very nice uh, recent experiments performed uh, using uh, uh, iron traps uh, in Vienna where you can actually do uh, uh, experiments on uh, quantumizing type systems and see uh, these non-analyticities in, in the dynamics. Okay. Okay. So what are we going to consider, right? So we're going to consider, you know, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, are there any assumptions about your? initial state here, such as that, I mean, it's a quench that's sufficiently strong that you're exciting uh, states up to some very high level, or... Uh... Yeah, good, good question. So I, I glossed over this a little bit. So usually, right, in any kind of quench problem, as we discussed a little bit before, you have some initial state that's a ground state of a Hamiltonian. You imagine abruptly changing coupling, you're not in the ground state, and indeed, non-equilibrium dynamics is non-trivial because you're exciting a whole bunch of different modes. These dynamical phase transitions typically arise, but not exclusively, when you do quenches across equilibrium phase transitions. Okay? So if you look at uh, this Ising model, say, okay, so this is the transverse field Ising model, you've got a bunch of uh, spins interacting along the z-direction, you apply a transverse field which doesn't commute with this, uh, and so it causes it to go from an ordered state to a paramagnetic state. The transition occurs when gamma is equal to j, and so if you start, let's say, in the ferromagnetic state and do a quench across that equilibrium transition, you typically see non-analyticities appearing in the temporal dynamics, okay? And so that's the kind of quenches that we'll look at uh, here, okay? Actually, just because it cropped up also in relation to kind of critical points, I mean, there are problems that we have in trying to address what happens if you say quench close to the critical point. You generically expect things like critical slowing down, and actually that's actually still hard for us to analyze in this stochastic approach, okay? But certainly resolving these features is something we can do, and we just wanted to show just as a point of principle, you can get these things out of a purely classical set of SDEs. Okay, so let's, let's look at this, right? So he says we want to understand then a quench in this problem. So as we discussed, we start in this initial ferromagnetic state. We're going to quench across the equilibrium transition. And the question is, what does the Loschmidt amplitude look like? Well, it turns out that if you look at these classical stochastic differential equations and compute this expectation value, then it has a very simple form, okay? So... If you remember in the parameterization we chose uh, with these decoupling variables, it was written in a particular way. It has an S plus, an SZ, and an S minus. That's actually convenient then to start in this all spins down state because S minus then annihilates that state. And so it means that actually not all of the variables appear explicitly in this expression for the Loschmidt amplitude. And so it says that actually for an arbitrary Hamiltonian that we just wrote down, the expression for the Loschmidt amplitude, starting in this initial state, has a very simple compact form, which is a product over all the sites of this lattice problem, of this disentangling variable psi z, and all the complexity resides not in the expression, but how you perform this average over the SDEs. Okay, so again, if you're used to thinking about, you know, integrable problems and then trying to imagine trying to 
look at dynamics in a non-integrable problem, actually it's not always obvious that you could write down an analytical formula for the observable you want, let alone compute its time dependence. Okay? So here this is a rather unusual approach that actually you start to be able to write down formulae for quantities you're interested in, and the main question is how far can you push the analysis to, to understand these quantities. Okay. Okay. So let me show you what happens then, right? So this is for a relatively small system size. This is for n equals seven spins, okay? But we're comparing exact diagonalization with the solution, numerical solution, of these stochastic differential equations. And you can see very clearly these Lochschmidt peaks, okay? If you try and go to larger systems, this is a 14 site system, okay? You can also do that, okay? And again, you can see very precisely resolved uh, Loschmidt peaks, okay? So the question is how far can you push this, okay? There are difficulties, okay? If you try to go to very late times with the SDEs that I wrote down, okay? They're nonlinear SDEs, which are known to have uh, divergent trajectories, okay? The nonlinearities grow, so there's no free lunch. Uh, I think that's actually, I have another student who's working on this. This is actually an artifact of the particular parameterization we choose uh, for describing this problem. Uh, in essence, we're describing a spin problem, uh, which is a kind of compact problem, and so it's should be possible to actually avoid uh, these divergences of the SDEs, okay? But nonetheless, I think the take-home message is we're solving classical stochastic differential equations and we're resolving rather subtle features of the temporal dynamics of a quantum many-body system, okay? And the, yeah. No, so what actually happens is, so, I, so uh, in, in our paper, I discuss this a little bit more clearly, we retain for any quantum observable 99% of all the trajectories. If the trajectory diverges, we have to just bin the trajectory because it never comes back, okay? However, what I'm arguing is, first of all, I think this is an artifact to the parameterization and can be avoided. Even if it can't be avoided, we know that actually all methods for dealing with quantum many-body systems at some stage have some feature which means that they're not perfect, they maybe not capture all of the relevant physics that you want. And so it could be that there are intrinsic late-time problems with this stochastic approach which can never be circumvented, okay? I don't know what the situation is at present, okay? What I know is that the nonlinear SDEs that we're solving at the moment have bad behaviors at late times. On the other hand, the question is, how far do you want to go, right? If you want to resolve three Loschmidt peaks for a small system, it's not a big deal. No, but if I look at the stochastic equations itself, it's not clear why uh, there should be problems at late times. Uh, no, no, but the point is... Uh, so I thought it is the averaging that is the... The, the problem is the... Um, sorry, let me go back. This is nonlinear, right? So psi dot has a nonlinear term. And so it's possible that if psi goes above a certain threshold, the nonlinearity grows and it sends your trajectory bombing off uh, to infinity and it never comes back, okay? But that, I believe, is an artifact to the parameterization. We have a very specific parameterization uh, of this problem, okay? And so you can write the SDEs down in different forms depending what parameterization you choose. And it could be that some parameterizations are better at handling late-time dynamics uh, and maybe for other observables there might be better... Uh, I mean, also you can see as well, we started explicitly in this ferromagnetic state, which was rather convenient for that particular choice of parameterization. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so these are, so this was for the integrable problem. This is for the integral, okay. Uh, I have extra transparencies at the end that I can return to, but I, I just removed them from the talk. But we also looked at the problem uh, in the presence of an integrability destroying perturbation, and it makes no difference. So the point is that if you look at, uh, for example, here, I mean, this is transverse field Ising. If I was to add a longitudinal field that breaks the integrability of the Ising model on the lattice, okay? Uh, but if you think about the SDEs, that just adds a constant term to these uh, noises that you're introducing anyway in the Z direction, okay? So from the perspective of the SDEs, they don't really care about integrability or non-integrability, okay? Any other questions? Okay. Um, okay, so 
I only have about a minute to go, so I'm not going to get through all of this, but, it, but it, it's fine anyway. So let me just kind of summarize just a few points, right? So, so we have an explicit expression for this Loschmidt amplitude, right? So it's some product over all of these sites of this classical variable averaged over this uh, stochastic variable. Okay? So it's an exponential of a sum then. Okay? So you can imagine introducing a sum over all of these Xi's on all of your different lattice sites, just divide it by n. So we call this capital Xi. There's a nice fat n then that sits out at the front. And so what he says is that you know, if there's peaks in lambda, that corresponds to turning points of A. So where might the turning points of A be? Well, this is the average of the exponential of a complex number with a real and an imaginary part. So you might imagine that the turning points are dominated by where the real part has a turning point because the amplitude of this complex number turns. Okay? So if you just look at these classical variables now and plot those as a function of time, the expectation is, and indeed is borne out, that you see nice features of these Loschmidt peaks directly in these classical distributions. Okay? If you look at them uh, for individual trajectories, you see the fluctuations, but the point is you can average these and you can work out uh, the locations of these uh, Loschmidt peaks very precisely. Okay? So let me skip over the kind of technical details of, of determining these and let me just show you one thing. This is what happens if you do this now for a 2D quantumizing model. It also has a quantum phase transition, now a different value of gamma, okay? But if you do a quench across the equilibrium phase transition, you can again use the same formula because it doesn't care. And you can see that indeed you see very nicely resolved Loschmidt peaks that are again uh, reflected in the classical distribution function. And those classical distribution functions you can actually plot to much larger system sizes. This is now for a 10 by 10 spin system. We're not computing the quantum expectation values, but we're plotting the behavior of these underlying classical variables. Okay? So that's a much larger spin system than you could deal with with exact diagonalization. But you can see that there's uh, signatures uh, in these classical uh, variables. Okay? So I think this is kind of interesting because it's a kind of huge kind of uh, now kind of open field uh, for trying to understand some very challenging problem, uh, problems in kind of non-integrable non systems. The method's readily parallelized. Uh, it shows very deep connections between quantum and classical dynamics. Uh, and as I said, one of the things we're trying to do is to generalize this uh, to open systems and to look at driven problems, uh, because this should also be doable uh, in this language of uh, classical SDEs. So I'll finish there. Thank you. More questions? Joshua. Stochastic equations, but in the SU2 example, there is, yeah. and uh, let, actually, there's something I glossed over. Okay, so let me let me just tell you about it. So one interesting thing is if you go through uh, this. Uh, uh, Loschmidt peak, okay, and you say, what are the classical variables doing? This is a plot of the distribution of those classical variables. And you can see that the distribution is broadening as you approach the transition, okay? So because of that, you can say, well, okay, let's just plot this explicitly. What does the distribution do? And so this is showing time evolving as you approach the Loschmidt peak. You see that the distribution broadens as you approach the peak and then comes back uh, and shrinks down again. Okay? So because of that, I think there's a, a very natural question, and I ask my students to look at this precisely because of this, that we're now describing a probability distribution for these classical variables. And so the question is, what is the equation governing this? Fokker-Planck equation. The problem is, in the case of the single cluster, the Fokker-Planck equation is a diffusion equation on SU2. Roughly speaking, what is the Fokker-Planck equation? It's the Schrodinger equation. Yes. So the question is whether or not it's actually solvable. I think one thing that gives me a little bit of confidence that there might be something interesting going on is that this, uh, because we're looking at these variables Xi, we're effectively summing over all lattice sites. Yes. So I think spatial homogeneity might actually be able to shrink the problem down in some way. Mm -hmm. And so rather than looking at probability distributions for size on every but site... In, in the large and limit, you have this uh, sort of uh, reduction to a single site or single plaquette. Yeah. 
I, I, I think so. I, there's yeah. something. No, no, it's no, no, no. It's 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 a mathematical fact that if you have in large n gauge theories, you can reduce everything to a single plaquette. It's uh, called uh, Kawai. Uh, um, I forgot. <laughs> so it's it's a non reduction. I see. Okay, yeah. that'd be quite interesting. Okay. Because there's there's also um, again one thing I didn't comment on very much, but you know if you look at this distribution uh, of this real part of psi, okay, it turns out there's a link to the imaginary part of one of these other variables. These profiles have very little dependence on system size. Okay, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, if you look at uh, the zeros of this uh, particular function, they're just completely n independent. Okay, for all system sizes. And one, one just last question. You focused on Loschmidt things, and uh, what about dynamical exponents uh, in, in ah, dynamical phase transitions? Ah, so okay, so so good. So let me just impact the, the the question a little bit, right? So there's a very natural question, just in general, that if you have such dynamical quantum phase transitions, is there anything known about the universal properties of such things? Are there things like critical exponents? Uh, there's a little bit of work in the literature by Marcus Heil, starting in a ferromagnetic state, if you uh, quench to the classicalizing model, because you can deal with the evolution, and trying to relate these non-analyticities to Ising critical exponents. What I suspect, okay, and this is something else we're looking at, is that because of this broadening that you see in the classical distributions, I think there's a very intimate relationship between the nature of the non-analyticities and dynamical critical exponents, okay, and the broadening of these classical distributions, okay? And so that's one thing I want to unpack. Also, in equilibrium, it turns out, you can ask similar questions uh, to understand what's the link between quantum phase transitions and classical, yeah. More questions? Up there. So you, you said there's no free lunch and you get these trajectories that, that d diverge. And so there's, I've seen similar stuff in quantum optics with positive P uh, representation where you, you try and solve exactly the evolution of the density matrix uh, using stochastic differential equations. And, and these trajectories turn out to be a problem. And, and so people have come up with, you said you would try and reparameterize. So people try to come up with effectively gauge transformations which remove these problems. But as far as I know, they... Uh, they're really hard to get rid of. I mean, uh, so essentially you, you're re reducing your problem you, to n differential equations, right? I mean, the, the system scales favorably with the number of spins, it seems, but you're fundamentally not going to describe the whole Hilbert space that way. Yeah, so, so it's a good question. So this cropped up actually in conversation yesterday. Okay, so actually um, the the... The Wigner distributions, I hadn't followed the literature very much actually in that regard because Wigner distributions are often associated with kind of pathological problems such as non-positivity. Here this is all an exact approach, okay? Um, however, I think that there are examples where actually some of those things are not an issue. In this particular case... I mean, the, posi the, the positive P is exact, actually. That's, that's not, you know, you get rid of the uh, yeah. problems with the Wigner function. Yeah. So, but just, it, just here... Just to come back, I mean, the parameterization is associated with a spin problem, effectively, okay? And so it's a question of how do you parameterize the spins on the block sphere, okay? So, in essence, this, this set of coordinates is a projective uh, map from the sphere to the plane. And if you're starting from the ground state and you want to point up, you go off to infinity, okay? On the other hand, you don't have to parameterize the block sphere in that way. You can double cover the sphere. And so the idea is that actually instead of seeing those divergences, you should just be able to map from the lower hemisphere to the upper hemisphere and avoid these. There's other parameterizations where you can actually get rid of the nonlinearities and turn multiplicative noise into uh, additive noise. Okay, so this is something I learned from chatting to Vladimir Gritsev last week, actually. Um, so I think... I think there's a lot of potential to avoid some of those pitfalls. It's always possible that actually there might be an interesting link between these positive P problems, and it could be that actually resolutions here might affect those, and it could be that actually we learn something that actually, again, there's no free lunch and actually you can't go any further. Um, so what I can say is at the moment what we've done is show that at least as a point of principle, for relatively small systems and in particular for non-integrable problems, this is an exact approach, and the main question is how far can it be pushed before it breaks down? Yeah. Last question. 
Uh, so I'm asking that uh, is this study can is extendable for any type of spin correlated system like non centrosymmetric and uh, something like this? I mean, what what is the most difficult? Uh, yeah, good. So, so here, if you look at uh, what was used, okay, so um, the main, okay, so it started from this Heisenberg uh, Hamiltonian, okay, sorry, let me go forward, okay, uh, with a priori arbitrary exchange interactions, okay, I've not specified anything explicitly about those. Most of the calculations were done in the case of the Ising model, okay. It gets more involved if you look at, for example, XXZ, so I have a student looking at this, because you need more hubbard stratonovich transformations. Uh, however, this is a rather generic bilinear expression in Lie algebra generators. Okay. So if you look at Vladimir's paper, it's kind of dynamical symmetry approach uh, to path integrals for quantum spin systems. This other paper by Galitsky really emphasizes the Lie algebraic approach. What it's saying is that Hamiltonians that are quadratic in spin operators can be decoupled and made linear, and then time evolution uh, you can disentangle directly in terms of the group elements. So I suspect there's a huge, huge family of problems that can be reformulated in terms of classical stochastic processes, provided they have this underlying Lie algebra uh, symmetry, which is really what we used uh, in order to disentangle these uh, these time-ordered uh, exponentials. Okay, so that's that's the main technical thing. Okay, thank you. And let's uh, thank Joe again.